All right, guys, if you open your Bibles with me to the book of Colossians, the book of Colossians chapter 1, and um, it was very difficult for me to decide what I'm going to talk about because I'm speaking at the conference in Chicago tomorrow, but I do not like practicing before I teach, so I'm not teaching what I'm teaching up there. But I've been going through the book of uh, the first chapter of Colossians here, and I thought this morning we would talk about God is still at work. And um, Colossians chapter 1 is just such an impactful chapter in our Bibles, and it, it talks, uh, it has so many good details about so many different things, specifically dealing with who the Lord Jesus Christ is and what the Father has provided for us. So if you look at Colossians chapter 1 and uh, look at verse 9. Let's just read verse 9 through 14. It says, For this cause we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you, and to desire that he might be filled with the knowledge of his will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding, that he might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all might according to his glorious power, unto all patience and long suffering, with joyfulness, giving thanks unto the Father, which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light, who had delivered us from the power of darkness, and it translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. And it's, it's such an impactful passage there. And actually the theme of the conference up in Chicago this week is based on verse 10, being fruitful in every good work. Um, but this morning we're going to talk about how God is still at work today. And I think it's important to point out how, how is God still at work today. A lot of people say God's still working today, but it's not really talked about how is he still at work? What is God doing today? How is God functioning today? And we're going to see that until we gain a basic understanding of God's word, we cannot walk right. We cannot walk well pleasing unto him because we have to understand what is God number 1 God's will for today and how does he work? today. Because if we don't understand those two things, it's not going to make sense on how we're going to live. And so Colossians chapter 1 does a fantastic job of showing us and giving us a proper understanding of God's will for today. And what it's going to do is, number one, what is God's will for today? Is that what? All men be saved and do what? Come to the knowledge of the truth. How are we going to come to the knowledge of the truth? We have to study God's Word, and we have to put things in their proper context. If I just wake up this morning and say, you know what, I'm going to pick up my Bible, and I'm going to go to this verse, and I'm going to apply this verse in my life today, guess what? Hopefully I didn't turn to a verse that says I need to go out and stone someone for stealing. We have to understand where the proper context fits in. And as we study and see in our Bibles, we begin to understand that God has two distinct programs that he has set up. Number one is, is that he set up, the first verse of our Bible kind of lays out how God is going to deal with mankind. It says, in the beginning God did what? Created the heaven and the earth. And throughout the Old Testament, all the way through Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John in the book of Acts, what is he dealing with? The earth. And then we get to Paul's epistles and he talks about the things that we've been blessed with in heavenly places in Christ. And now he's talking about all these spiritual applications that we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and things and spiritual wickedness in high places. We see a transition from the physical, which the nation of Israel looked at, to the spiritual, which is us, the members of the body of Christ today. And so we're going to see, we need to understand how God's working. How we're going to do that is, is that God gave us a specific apostle that he wrote directly to us. And that's the apostle Paul here. And what, chat, what are we reading? Colossians. Who wrote the book of Colossians? Paul did. And we're going to see some things that applies to our life. So understanding, a proper understanding of God's will for today is going to enable us, number one, to walk worthy. To walk worthy. Look why I say that. Look at verse 9. Colossians chapter 1, verse 9 and verse 10. He says, For this cause we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to desire that he might be filled with the knowledge of what? His will in all wisdom and what? Spiritual understanding. When we are filled with his understanding, with knowledge, with wisdom, look what the result is in verse 10, that ye might what? 
walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing. Well, what does that mean? It means that we can walk in an appropriate and godly manner in our everyday walk. You know, you mentioned something. Keep your hand in Colossians, but look at Ephesians chapter 4. You mentioned something similar here. In Ephesians chapter 4, and verse 1, Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 1, it says, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that ye walk how? Worthy of the vocation wherewith ye are, what? Called. What is a vocation? It's a job. We as the members of the body of Christ, do we have jobs? We all have a job, and our job is, is to walk worthy of what? The vocation wherewith ye are called. Who's been called? Any person that's trusted the gospel, that's who's been called. And we need to be walking worthy of that. And we need to do it unto all pleasing. Look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. In verse 1. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse 1. Look what he says. He says, Furthermore, then we beseech you, brethren, and exhort you by the Lord Jesus, that as ye have received of us, how ye ought to walk and to what? Please God, so ye would abound, how much? More and more. So he's not saying you guys aren't walking in an appropriate manner, but what he's saying is, is the things that's been delivered to them, they need to continue to do what? abound more and more. He doesn't say one day, you know what, I've reached the pinnacle of spiritual maturity. I don't need to walk in worthy anymore because I'm doing that constantly. What do we need to keep doing? Walk worthy of who we are. And by the way, how are we going to do that? Not by our will, but by God's. And God is going to be the one to do the work in and through us. But the only way he's going to be able to do that is, is if we understand what his word teaches us and we believe what his word teaches us. Go with me to back to the book of Colossians. Colossians chapter 1. Look at verse 11. Colossians chapter 1. And look at verse 11. Verse 10, though, says that he might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work, and, notice what he says, increasing where? In the knowledge of God. How do we increase in the knowledge of God? Through his word. How do I do that? Well, I'm going to have to say, you know what? I'm going to be intentional. I'm going to pick up God's Word. I'm going to read God's Word. I'm going to study God's Word the way that He wants me to do it. And how does He want us to do it? By learning about who we are in Christ. How are we going to learn about who we are in Christ? By understanding that if I go to the books of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, am I going to really get to know who I am in Christ? Or am I going to get to learn about Christ? I'm going to get to learn about who Christ is. I'm going to learn about who he is to his people. I'm going to learn about how he lived his life. I'm going to learn about some of the things that he did. But am I going to learn about who I am in Christ? No. But if I get to the book of Romans, I'm going to start to see what? Who I am in Christ. Who we are in Christ. Right? And so when we're reading the book of Colossians, are we learning about who we are in Christ? Exactly. That's what we're learning about. So we're starting to see that. And then you get to verse 11. Strengthened with all what? Might. I like that word might. If you look up that word might and what it deals with, it deals with ability, strength, a force, a purpose. You know? And he says, strengthen with all might according to what? Notice though. His glorious power unto all patience and long suffering with joyfulness. So we're strengthened with all might and that might comes through the power that works within us and then it's going to work through us which comes ultimately from who? God. And then the same power also that we need to think about this when we think about the words power and might. The power and might that raised Christ from the dead now lives within us because the Spirit of God indwells who? The believer. It's a lot of things to think about. Where does the Spirit of God dwell, though? In us. He says, knowing not that your bodies are the temple of what? 
the Holy Ghost which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own. Why? For ye bought with a price. What price were we bought with? The blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Why? So that God could take us who were dead in sin, us who did not have strength. You know, he says in Romans, for when we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. When we were without strength, when we were without might, Christ took it upon himself that he's going to pay the penalty of all sin because we were weak, but he's strong, right? And Christ died on that cross for our sins, was buried and rose again the third day. And how did he do it? Weakly and tired and worn out? Or did he do it with power and might? He had power and might that raised him from the dead the third day to bring us justification, to bring us life. And it says here in this verse, strengthen with all might according to his glorious power. Guess where that power now dwells? In us. Guess what we need to do? We need to acknowledge the fact that the power of God indwells us as the believers today. And you know what that power of God does? It doesn't take away the problems we face in life, but it strengthens us so that we can get through the problems of this life. You see that? Isn't that wonderful, by the way? that God provided that for us. That gets me excited to see that. Go with me to a few verses. Romans chapter 15. Romans chapter 15. Romans chapter 15. And look at verse 13. Romans 15 verse 13 says, Now the God of what? Hope fill you with all joy and peace how in believing that ye may abound in hope and notice how we're going to do it through the power of what the holy ghost and where does the holy ghost dwell in us who is the god of hope our god who's going to be the one to strengthen us it's going to be god how is he going to do it by the holy ghost that's in us how are we going to feed it? By the book, by the Word of God. You see that? You know, it tells us to be filled with the Spirit. Does the Spirit of God already dwell in us? So how are we filled with the Spirit today? By getting into God's Word. And when we do that, guess what happens? It strengthens us with all might by His glorious power. Not by our power, but by His See that? Go with me to Ephesians, or Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3. And look at verse 7. Philippians chapter 3. And look at verse 7. He says, But what things were gained to me, those I counted loss for who? Christ. Well, what's he talking about? Go back to verse 4. He says, Though I might ha also have confidence, where? In the flesh. What is he going to say? He says, I'm going to talk about the power that I had. The might that I had. And look what he says. If any other man thinketh that he where might trust in the flesh, I more. Circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, is touching the law of Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, touching the righteousness which is in the law. What does he say? Blame us. He says, notice what's taking place there. This is what I'm doing. This is what I'm doing. This is what I'm doing. And what does he say? Verse 7, but what things were gained, notice to who? It doesn't say what things were gained to him. It was to who? To me. Those I counted loss for who? Christ. All of the accolades, all of the awards, all of the things, guess what he says? I count it all loss. Why? Verse 8. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung that I may win who? He says, all of these things, my losses, my successes, I'm going to leave them back there because I want to get to know who the Lord Jesus Christ is. How does he want to know him? Verse 9, and be found in him, not having what? Mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through what? The faith of Christ. He says, I'm not going to rely on myself. I'm going to totally rely on Christ, the true and faithful one. And then he says, 
the righteousness which is of God by faith. Verse 10, this is the verse I want to get to. He says that I may what? Know him. Do we want to know him? I think we do. How do we want to know him? Look what he says. And the what? There's that term again. The power of what? His resurrection. And the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death. Paul is saying we want to be completely identified with the Lord Jesus Christ. Romans 6, 7, and 8 teaches us that, doesn't it? That we are completely identified. We are completely made one with Christ. You know, I'm excited. I'm, we're going to be up at the... Um, conference and I'm talking about my topic I'm going to talk about is our Abba Father and I'm really excited to talk about it because it, we're going to look at the relationship that the Father and that the Son has and the unison and that how they are one and that now we today think about this we today as the members of the body of Christ now that relationship that was between the Father and the Son we're in there we're a part of that we're a part of the power and the might from the Father. Doesn't that get you excited? And to think about that, as Christ's power works in and through us, you know how it's going to be revealed, by the way? Through our attitudes. Through how we live. Through how we conduct ourselves. Through how we speak. People notice the difference, by the way. And what's wonderful to see is, is that God... It's going to produce something in our lives. Look what it does. That was the introduction, by the way. Colossians chapter 1. We're going to see what his power then produces in our lives. In Colossians chapter 1, verse 11, it says, Strengthen with all might, according to his glorious power, unto all, what? Patience. So the first thing we see here, his power that works in us, his strength that is in us, his might that's in us, produces what? Notice the first thing it talks about. Patience. Why? What is patience? Patience is the ability to endure when circumstances are difficult. How many of us have faced difficult circumstances in our lives? All of us have, right? And so it gives us the ability to do that. Biblical patience, by the way, is not us just sitting around waiting for God to do something. What it teaches us is, is that the power of God is working in us, and now it's up to us to go and do the work. You know, so many people want to just sit by and let other people do the work. I like to do that sometimes. If you ask my guys that work for me, they'll say, he never works. He just comes and looks and tells us to do things and then leaves. Right, Drew? Yeah, that's what I do. Why? Because I just go home and play video games all day, guys. Duh. <laughs> no, right? And, and, but we want to stand by and not get involved sometimes. And what patience carries the idea of is that if you imagine a runner on a racetrack and he's running and then he gets tired, does he want to quit? Sure, sometimes. But what do they do? You push through it and you push and you're tired and you're worn out and you're running and you're tired and you're worn out and then you know what eventually happens? You get your second wind and then you're able to finish. You know what God has provided us? A constant second wind. We get tired and we say, you know what, I can't do it. And then God says, about time you said that because it's not going to be you that does it anyways. It's going to be me doing it in and through you. And God is going to be the one to do the work in and through us. And he gives us the ability to have patience, to press on. Go to Romans chapter 5. Look at Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5. And look at verse 1. He says, Therefore, being justified, how? By faith. How is everyone justified? By faith. Is it by faith and maybe I need to do this one thing? How are we justified? By faith and faith alone. He says, therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we, what? Where is our standing? In grace. And he says, and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And not only so, but we glory in what? 
Brother Tim this morning was talking about the term glory that's mentioned throughout the Bible and all the different ways that it's used. And look at the way this is used. He talked about the glory of God and the hope we have, but then in the next one he's talking about that we glory in what? Tribulations. Now when you hear the word tribulation, do you get excited? I don't think any of us will be like, oh yeah, I'm so excited for that. But you know what? We should get excited. Because look what it produces. It says, and not only so, but we glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulation worketh what? Patience. So if we look at tribulation, instead of going, oh man, I do it. I see tribulation, I see a problem arise, and I'm like, I am not looking forward to this. But instead of doing that, a tri when we face tribulation, we need to look at tribulation as it's an opportunity for God to be displayed in that moment. And so what we see here is this tribulation worketh what? Patience. Where does patience come from? The might that works within us. And patience, what? Experience. And experience, what does it bring? Hope. And then at the ultimate return, he says, and hope maketh what? Not ashamed. What does that mean? It means when we see the tribulation, instead of standing by and or saying, oh, I'm going to get away from that. When we see the tribulation, then we know the end result of the tribulation is what? It's hope. But there's steps to get to that. We've got patience, we've got the experience, and then we get the hope. You see that? And hope, by the way, when it's used in our Bibles, is confidence. It's a surety. It's not, oh, maybe. And hope maketh not ashamed. Why? Because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is what? Given unto us. Go with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 12. 2 Corinthians chapter 12. In verse 7, 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Look at verse 7. It says, Unless I should be exalted above measure, through the abundance of the revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. And then notice verse 8. I think this verse is a very relatable, relatable verse. It says, For this thing I besought the Lord thrice, that it might, what? Depart from me. So three separate times Paul prays and says, Lord, please take this away from me. Is there instances in our life when there's tribulation or problems that we might want to pray, Lord, please take this away from me? Sure there is. But look at what the response is then. It says, And he said unto me, my grace is what? Sufficient for thee. For my strength is made perfect where? In weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my what? Infirmities. That the power of Christ may do what? Rest upon me. So the response the third time the Lord answers and tells him, my grace is sufficient for thee. It is enough, Paul. It is going to be able to sustain you. It's going to be able to get you through these difficulties in life. And instead of Paul throwing a big old pity party, you know what he says? He says, I believe your word. And you know what it does? It strengthens them. Now, it doesn't say that process is always easy, does it? But what does he do? He takes God at his word. And then he says in verse 10, Therefore I take pleasure... You see that? When we hear tribulation, infirmity, we don't take pleasure necessarily, do we? But Paul says what? Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses, for Christ's sake, for when I am weak, then am I what? Strong. Why? Because the Word of God, Paul is taking the Word of God, he's believing the Word of God, he's trusting the Word of God, and he says, you know what? His Word is enough. His grace is enough. I am complete in the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm going to go through sufferings. We are going to go through sufferings of this present time. But guess what? He tells us that it's not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. We have that relationship, by the way, now. You know what we have to do? We have to believe it and trust it. Is the power of God in us? Yes. Does the power of God give us the ability to produce patience in our lives? Yes. And as today goes on and on, we become more and more impatient. 
When someone says something, what is the first thing we do? We pick up our phones and fact check them. Why? Because I want the information now and I want it yesterday. Right? And you have the ability to do that. And so what is it produced? Well, it's produced, well, instead of st sitting down and reading God's word and studying it, I'll just, I'll just Google it. That's how I write all my lessons, by the way, guys. Just Google it. No. You got to put, you got to put the study in. You got to put the time in. Because what it does is, is it allows us to be able to learn who we are in Christ. And we have to put the time in for ourselves. You know, that was one of the biggest things I was encouraged always to do is make sure you have personal Bible study time for yourself. Not just, you don't study to teach other people. You study to get to know God's word. Naturally, what comes from that is, is the ability to share with others. Because when you study it for yourself and then you go to share it with someone, it's going to mean a lot more. If I go and study something because someone else wants me to study it and I go and study it, I might have the answer, but it might not mean the same thing to me. And so God produces patience. And a lot of believers quit when circumstances become difficult. But what we need to do is, is realize that it's His Spirit that's working in and through us. The second thing that God's, God does and produces in our life is, is long-suffering. Patience and long-suffering. Tied together but mean different things, don't they? Long-suffering means what? We're going to suffer long. It's not going to be easy. It's going to be a long road. Patience, I look at, it has more to do with circumstances, long-suffering has more to do with people. Does that make sense? We have certain circumstances, we're going to need patience. Long-suffering is going to come through dealing with people. Why? Because people drive you crazy. I drive you guys crazy, I know, okay? But we have to think about that. Paul mentions, this is interesting, Paul mentions the word long-suffering the most in the Bible. It's kind of interesting. He had to deal with a lot of people, didn't he? It's amazing that we can endure tough circumstances better than we can endure people. Think about that. The little things in life is what bothers me the most. You know, little inconveniences, you go to do a little project and then something breaks and then it's like, turns into this whole big thing. The little things drive me nuts. You can ask my wife. It's the little things. We get a big problem, I'm perfectly fine to deal with the problem, but it's the little problems that drive me nuts. And it's something that I have to, to work on. We can endure a lot of times the big things, but when our loved ones, something small happens or something, something happens with one of our loved ones, we snap at them, you know? I'm not saying I snap at my wife, okay? I'm sure I have, and I have. Usually it's when I'm hungry. And then I eat, and I'm like, oh, sorry about that. I was just, you know, blood sugar was a little low. It's always funny. We start getting a little snippy sometimes, and then we're like, when's the last time we ate? Oh, like four hours. Yeah, we need to eat something. You know, or it's late at night. We're getting tired. Oh, well, we need to go to bed and take a rest, you know? Something I was taught a long time ago is, is they never go to bed angry at each other. If we have something that's going on, you deal with it right then. You know, people always make that joke, oh, you're going to sleep on the couch tonight. Surprisingly, I've never slept on the couch. All right? You know why? Because communication, godly communication is key to any relationship. Open, honest, godly communication. Go with me to the book of Psalms. I want to show you this verse. Psalms chapter 86. Psalms chapter 86. And look at verse 11. I want to get to verse 15, but look at verse 11. He says, Teach me thy way, Psalm 86, verse 11. Teach me thy way, O Lord. I will walk in thy truth. Unite my heart to fear thy name. I will praise thee, O Lord my God, and notice how, with what? All my heart. And I will glorify thy name forevermore. For great is thy mercy toward me, and thou hast delivered my soul from the lowest hell. O God, the proud are risen against me, and the assemblies of violent men have sought after my soul, and have not set thee before them. You feel like that sometimes today? You start looking at the things that society promotes. 
and makes it seem that it's okay. You look at where they're attacking now, the strongest is where? Children. Why? Because they're going to try to take a generation that could be raised godly, and instead they're going to be raised with their ideologies and the things that are contrary to who God is. And what does that do to society, by the way, today? It degrades it and it brings it down. You know, a scary statistic I just saw is that there's 22 million children that grow up in the United States, just in the United States, without a father in the home. And that includes like a stepfather or anything. That's, that's these single moms having to raise it. And what happens to the single moms? Well, the children need to eat, so what do they have to go and do? They have to go and get a job. And then you know where the kids go? They go to school. You know what they're teaching our kids in school nowadays? They're teaching elementary grade school kids that it's okay to have two mommies, two daddies, whatever it is. It's okay to believe that there's no God. That's what they teach in our schools today. How does that influence their minds? You know, for a school system that says they don't want to influence the kids, they're doing a pretty good job influencing the kids. And what's happening to our society? It's degrading, it's getting worse and worse and worse. Isn't that sad? But look what God is. Look what God is. Verse 15, But thou, O Lord, art a God full of, what? Compassion and, what? Gracious. Notice the next one that it says, Long-suffering and plenteous in mercy and truth. You know what's wonderful about seeing who God is? Was God that way for his nation, Israel? Is God still that way for us today? Is our God a God full of compassion? You know who it's talking about too? It's talking about our Father. That's who our Father is. This is what the world needs to know. This is who our God is. We're so fortunate that God doesn't treat us the way we treat other people. He treats us with love and compassion and long-suffering. You know why? Because we can look at God and see how he has long-suffering and patience towards us, and then it gives us the ability to go out and his power working in and through us to have patience and long-suffering with others. Go with me to the book of 1 Corinthians 13. 1 Corinthians chapter 13. 1 Corinthians chapter 13. I have no idea what time I started, so we're just going to go through it. 1 Corinthians chapter 13. And look at verse 4. Charity, notice the first thing charity does. What? Suffereth long. And what is charity? Charity. Charity is the benevolent, unconditional, it's the love of God. It deals with the edification of others. And the first thing that charity is going to do is what? Suffereth long. Do we suffer long? You know, the thing we always say is, is when we come to these verses, you take that word charity that's used and you put your name there. And then you start to think about, do I suffer long? And is what? Kind. Am I kind? Charity envieth not. Charity vaunteth not itself, is not puffed up, does not behave itself unseemly, seeketh not her own, is not easily provoked. Look what it does too. Thinketh what? No evil. Rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoiceth where? And the truth beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things. Notice what it says there endureth what? All things. What is our charity never what? Faileth. What does our society teach today? If my marriage is tough, you know what I'm going to do? I'm just going to go and get a divorce. But what does that say there? Endureth what? All things. What does? The benevolent love of God. Understanding His love. Understanding how He works. Why? Because God is what? Love. 
It's who he is. It's how he displays it. What does charity do? It suffers long, it's kind, thinketh no evil, rejoiceth not in iniquity. It bears up, it holds. How are we going to have long suffering? By understanding the charity, by understanding God's love, by understanding that it's his power that works in and through us. His love teaches us how to suffer long. Why? Because he suffers long towards us. I can't imagine being a perfect and holy and righteous God and having to put up with us. The only way that it can, he can do that is his love. Isn't that a wonderful thing? You know why? Because when he sees us, he sees his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. The Father said, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. You know who he sees in us? Christ. We need to see ourselves that way too. It's not enough to say, Well, God sees me that way. We need to say, God sees me as accepted in his Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. I need to go out and live as one of his sons and daughters. I need to rest in the fact that that's how God sees me. Does God's view of us change, by the way? It sure doesn't. It's his power that works in and through us. So his, his power produces patience. His power produces long-suffering. His power also produces joy. There's such a thing, by the way, as patient that endures but doesn't have joy. You say, I'm going to just put up with this for the time being and get through this. Right? There's a such thing as that. But how do we have joy through tough circumstances? It's going to be by His Spirit in our inner man working in and through us. Go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. And look at verse 5 and 6. He says, For our gospel came not unto you in word only, but also in what? Power. And in much, and in the Holy Ghost, and in much assurance, as ye know what manner of men we were among you for your sake, and ye became followers of us and of the Lord, having received the word in what? Much affliction with what? Joy of the Holy Ghost. So the power of God produces what in our lives? It can produce joy. Go back to Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1, verse 11 and 12. It says, Strengthen with all might, according to his glorious power, unto all patience and long suffering, with joyfulness, Giving thanks unto who? The Father. So he, his power, his word produces patience, long-suffering, joy. And you know what else it produces in our lives? Thankfulness. <laughs> Giving thanks unto the Father, which hath made us what? Meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints. Where? In light. As God's Spirit strengthens our inner man, we become what? We can become thankful. Mature believers who understand God's Word can be thankful in all of our circumstances. Not thankful for all of our circumstances, but thankful in all of our circumstances. Why do I say that? Look at 1 Thessalonians 5. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Look at verse 16. It says what? Rejoice how often? Evermore. Joy is not based on what? Circumstances. Pray without ceasing. Is prayer based on circumstances? No. In everything give thanks. Is giving of thanks based on circumstances? No. You see how all those connect? In everything give thanks for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. What's the will of God? Well, one of the parts of that is, is that in everything give what? Thanks. For what? For the things that the Father, the, for the things that God has provided. That's one of the things. In everything, do what? Give thanks. 
Isn't that wonderful we can do that? Go back to Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1. Verse 12, it says, Giving thanks unto the Father, which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. Verse 13, he says, Who had delivered us from the what? Power of darkness. And it translated us into the kingdom of who? His dear son. Who did that, by the way? The Father. He took us who were bound by the power of darkness. And he did what? He took us and he placed us in Christ. And as we're placed into Christ, we're translating in the kingdom of his dear son. We're delivered from darkness and now we live in what? Light. And then verse 14 says, In whom we have redemption through his blood, even the what? Forgiveness of sins. How many sins are forgiven, by the way? Do I have to confess those sins to be forgiven? Or am I forgiven? When the Father sees the Lord Jesus Christ, does he see him as perfect? Does he see him as accepted? How does he see us then? The same way, because God takes us from the power of darkness, a life full of sin, and he takes us and he places us in Christ. So that when he sees us, all my stuff's getting soaked in my truck bed right now. He takes us, all my luggage that's going to Chicago is getting wet right now in the back of my truck. It's too late now. It doesn't matter. It's wet now. God takes us. It wasn't supposed to rain, by the way. See, that's why I don't have hope in the weatherman. It said no rain, and then it rains. It wasn't supposed to rain until 1 o'clock. It's 11.40. Just now raining. No hope. No hope in the weatherman. God takes us, and he places us in the Lord Jesus Christ. Why does he do that? Because when he does that, then he sees us as how? He can look at us and say, he sees no sin. Because in the Lord Jesus Christ, did the Lord Jesus Christ ever sin? No. Was there any guile found in him? When the Father sees the Son, he sees him as perfect. He was the perfect sacrifice. And when we take our faith and place our faith into his faithfulness, you know how he then sees us? Same way he sees Christ. And he says that when he sees us that way, he's forgiven us all of our sin. Does that mean he's going to bring up a sin? Or does that mean it's dealt with? It's completely dealt with. When the Father sees us, he sees us as we are in Christ. And you know what that does then? It can produce in our lives strength, power, might, patience, long-suffering, joy, thankfulness. All the things that the Lord Jesus Christ had we can have. We can display. You know what we have to do, though? We just have to take this book. We have to read it. We have to study it. We have to meditate on it. We have to pray about it. But ultimately, we need to believe it. It says that when we believe and trust God's word, it works in us effectually. It works from the inside out. And it takes someone that is full of sin that is contrary to who he is. And it makes it someone that's well-pleasing unto him. Isn't that wonderful? Is God still at work today? He sure is. How does he work today? Through his word and and through us. You know, so when people say God's still at work, don't instantly say, oh, no, he's not, no, he's not. Say he is, but let's talk about how he's at work. How is he working today? Not working the way most, most people say, but he is at work. Amen? Let's give thanks. Father, thank you for us being able to um, come here this morning to fellowship and study your word together. Thank you for us being able to see the life that we have in the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you for being able to produce in our lives patience, long-suffering, joyfulness, and thanks. And thank you for giving us your perfect word that we can come to, trust, believe, and have complete hope in. And as always, we give thanks by the Lord Jesus Christ who gave himself for us so that we can have life in him 
And it's in his name we pray. Amen. All right. Thank you, guys. Um, we will see.